trying to destroy the British Empire, which he did because he knew that there were far more claims on the Bank of England than they had gold, and that would be inherently unstable, and that would derail sterling as one of the global reserve currencies and undermine the British Empire, which it did. So um, that's a little, uh, a little bit of a backstory, but it goes to the point that uh, Keynes was, was an advocate for gold at different times in his career and, and, and at the end of his career. And that when the central banks are buying, I should tell you something. Now, I've said for years, um, you know, I've always pointed to Russia and China. Russia has uh, almost quadrupled their gold reserves in the last 12 years, starting in 2009 through 2020, uh, 2021. They've almost quadrupled from about 600 tons to about 2,400 tons. China, the same from about 600 tons to about just under 2,000 tons that they report, but they're non-transparent. They have a lot more gold than that uh, stashed in uh, something called SAFE, the State Administration on Foreign Exchange, which is a secretive Chinese stock and wealth fund run by an ex pimco guy, by the way. He knows what he's doing. Um, and they, they're non-transparent. So the People's Bank of China is kind of transparent. SAFE is non-transparent. So every... Uh, six, seven years, what you'll see is the People's Bank of China will announce, oh, we've increased our gold reserves by 400 tons or 500 tons or whatever as the case may be. And well, it sounded like they went out the night before and bought 600 tons. You know, good luck trying that. You can't do it. Well, what it means is that that SAFE took some of the, the hidden gold that they've been acquiring slowly and moved in an accounting entry, moved it over to the People's Bank of China, and boom, there's 500 tons overnight. But of course, they had it all along, and they still do. So they probably have more. So Russia and China are big acquirers, you know, tripling and quadrupling their gold reserves. But now we're seeing it in a lot of other countries. Um, in the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, uh, Iran is a major buyer, but non, non-transparent. Turkey has drastically increased its gold reserves. These are these are major countries, uh, and they're they're adding. So so I look at that, and this was very good data from the IMF and the World Gold Council, so you can find this information. But the one that was just like not doing anything was Japan. They had about six hundred tons, but they had six hundred tons for thirty years, and then just about um, at this point, about six months ago, so late last summer. They bumped it by, uh, I believe it was, it was 50 tons, perhaps more. I look at the exact number, but it was over 50 tons overnight. It just went from, you know, 600 tons to 650 tons, just like that. Well, here's what you know. The same thing I said about Russia. You can't buy 50 tons overnight. Or not, you couldn't even do it in a month. I mean, the, the dealers would be working the order. It would be disruptive to the market. It would show, it would leave a lot of fingerprints, put it that way. But what it tells you is two things. Number one, Japan had the gold all along. They had it in some sidecar or side account or Ministry of Finance hidden account, what as the case may be. And they chose to move it over to their reserve position, which they can do. That's an accounting entry. But they had to have they had to have had the gold all along because you can't buy that much that fast. So then that begs the question: Well, why all of a sudden? Why now after decades? of holding your gold level constant, you go a sudden step up in a big way. Um, a lot of possible answers to that. One, you know, China's making noises about invading Taiwan. Well, if you're going to invade Taiwan, why not invade Japan while you're at it? It's just another chain of islands as far as the Chinese are concerned. Um, and after this happened right around the time, maybe shortly after um, the U.S. debacle in Afghanistan, which was, you know, the worst foreign policy, uh, military disgrace, humiliation in U.S. history that I can remember. I don't know how far you have to go back to find a worse uh, turn of turn of events, and and that there it was. Well, all of a sudden, allies all over the world, you know, Israel, um, Japan, Taiwan, they're questioning the United States. Like, hey, we're you, we thought you're un- we're under your nuclear umbrella. You stand by us through thick or thin. Here, you leave Americans behind enemy lines. Perhaps, now this is speculation, but perhaps Japan sees the threat to Taiwan, feels they may be in the in the sights of the Chinese, feels the United States may not be as reliable as one had thought, and says, well, we have to we now have to step up a little bit financially, militarily, et cetera. And they're doing that. But it but that aside, that's a little geopolitical speculation, but that aside, the goal is real. They put it on the books. So the biggest buyers of the gold in the world are the central banks. By the way, from 1970 to 2010, 
central banks were net sellers. Now, some bought and some sold, but on, on net, they were net sellers. We had Brown's Bottom in 1999 when the UK sold half their gold at the lowest price in uh, about 60 years. They, they literally hit the bottom of about $200 an ounce, give or take. But, um, but since 2010, central banks in the aggregate have been net buyers, net buying is accelerating. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the most knowledgeable players in the world are adding gold to their reserves because they consider that a prudent hedge to the U.S. dollar, if you have U.S. dollar inflation, or to a collapse of confidence in uh, central bank currencies generally, um, or they're just saying, hey, we're, we're, we're part of the club. Uh, by the way, here's a good uh, trivia question for you. Uh, you know, if you're not in a bar and a lot of brainy economists around, uh, ask them, uh, bet, them uh, bet them a drink on this. Ask them what percentage of U.S. reserves are in gold. The, the answer in China is about 2%. Russia is about 20%. You know what the percentage is for the United States? 75%. The U.S. does not rely on euros and Nazi dollars and Canadian dollars for its reserve position. 75% of U.S. reserves are in gold. So don't let don't let any central banker, don't let uh, Jay Powell or Jenny Yellen or any of these others tell you that gold is not a monetary asset. We have the largest gold stash in the world. And 75% of our reserves are in gold. So that's the U.S., uh, you know, as, as they say, uh, watch what they do, not what they say. When people talk about the price of gold, people say, well, gold went up. And then they say, gold went down, you know. Um, but what? But gold really didn't do anything. Gold is a, is, is an element. It's a ton of number 79. It's a very nice, very attractive metal. What changed was the dollar price. So that's what people mean. When they say gold went up, they mean the dollar price went up. And if they say gold went down, they mean the dollar price went down. Um, well, but what does it really mean? Does that, is that telling you something about gold? Or is it telling you something about the currency? Uh, and I would say when the um, dollar price of gold goes down, that means the dollar got stronger. Each dollar buys you a little more gold. And when the dollar price of gold goes up, I would say the dollar got weaker because each dollar buys you a little less gold. Uh, when you translate it into weight, I always think about gold by weight. That's why I keep talking about tons and so forth, uh, metric tons. So, um, so fluctuations in the dollar price of gold tell you more about dollars than they do about gold. It tells you about the strong dollar and the weak dollar. So as the dollar price of gold goes up, what it means is that the dollar is getting weaker now. So if you want to know the dollar price of gold, just do a long-term forecast on the currency. And you'll get to the dollar price of gold very quickly. So when you say, you know, is gold a good asset? Is it a good diversifier? Um, is the price going up in the long run? Great questions. And the way I think about it is, well, what's going to happen to the dollar in the long run, up or down? Well, what's the history of all central bank currencies? What's the history of all fiat currencies? What's the history of inflation? They all go down over time, not, not all at once. Um, and that's another source of confusion because people look at, well, the dollar euro cross rate, or they say euro to dollar cross rate, is the, is the most heavily traded liquid, you know, foreign exchange cross rate in the world by far. So, uh, and in the past, I would say two months, euro has fallen from about a dollar 20 to today, it's about a dollar 13. That's a significant decline in the value of the euro and a significant increase in the value of the dollar. So a lot of times when people say the dollar is stronger or weaker, they're actually not thinking about gold on the ways we just discussed. They're thinking about some dollar index. But if you, if you peel back the layers of the onion for every index, Dow Jones, Bloomberg, Fed, it's all basically the euro, US dollar cross rate. So yeah, there's some Canadian, Australian, and yen, and sterling. There were, there's some other currencies in there, but the euro is the line of shares. All these indices are really euro dollar cross rates. So when people say the dollar is stronger, well, it's another way of saying the euro is weaker. Um, but, but currencies tend to trade within a range. They'll, they'll get here or go here, but they're not like stocks. You know, major currencies, they don't go to zero. I mean, Zimbabwe, yeah, but the, the Australian dollar, Euro, they're not going to zero. But they don't go to the moon the way Apple stock or Amazon does. They're, they can be strong or weaker, but they, they tend to trade within a range, which is, makes it, makes them interesting to trade because you can spot those inflection points. So right now, when people talk about the strong dollar, they're really referring to the dollar value of a euro. But you could have a situation where uh, gold is going much higher in dollar values, and it would be, as I said, a weak dollar. And yet the, the euro could be falling faster than the dollar. So people 
People always look at the euro and they say strong dollar, weak dollar compared to the euro. My only advice is look at the dollar price of gold. Use that as your thermometer. You know, a doctor walks into the room, they see a patient, they don't know anything. What's well, the first thing they do? They take their temperature. So uh, if you want to take the dollar's temperature, look at the dollar price of gold. So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever is the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down, but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the US debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. With some exceptions, but they, they kind of like, you know, an inch a year, a couple inches a year, but they, but they move mountains. I mean, they just, they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful, but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of, of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but you can apply this to any country, I focus on the, the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. In a simple example, if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least default on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you, know, you just write a check, it's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not, unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The US just hit uh, $31 trillion in, uh, in national debt, that is national debt, almost all of it in the form of U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly U.S. Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130 percent. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30 percent. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions, no big deal. 30% um, is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. Uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Master's Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do, you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or, or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. If you, uh, you say, what's the critical threshold where, you know, water turns to steam or, you know, water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same. It's, it's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The, end, the, best, the, the best research says the answer is 90%. And this comes out of, you know, Ken Rogoff at uh, Harvard, also Carmen Reinhardt, who's now the uh, chief economist at the World Bank. But they've looked at uh, hundreds of cases over hundreds of years. And I like that because it's not just, you know, kind of cherry picking data. Uh, developed economies, developing economies, uh, economies that issue debt in their own currencies, ones that issue debt in other currencies, principally U.S. dollars, et cetera. So, you know, a wide variety of case studies. And they show that not, when you when your debt to GDP, GDP ratio goes over 90%, your, your multiplier of an additional debt, uh, of additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context, at, at 30%, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar 30 of growth. You know, assuming you spend it wisely, that's a, that's a big condition, but uh, 
you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar thirty of growth. Okay, the debt was productive if you if you put it to good use. Uh, but that that dollar thirty gets smaller and smaller. As you get closer to ninety percent, it goes to a dollar twenty, a dollar ten, a dollar five. Past ninety percent, you know, roughly, uh, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar and you only get ninety five cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then ninety percent and eighty five percent, etc. So ninety percent is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131 percent, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, you know, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of uh, modern monetary theory. She's a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter that uh, you know, she, they always point to Japan. Japan is at uh, 280%, um, way past any any member of the peer group. Um, China's probably higher. China's a little more opaque because, well, because they are, but also they they don't have as much national debt. If you, if you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of, of provincial debt. And the banks, the banking system is is owned by the government or controlled by the government. So when you throw in, when you throw in the bank debt, the state-owned enterprises, the provincial debt, and the and the government. So that's the real national debt. Kelton says, Stephanie Kelton says, uh, it doesn't matter because um, you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentina and you borrow in dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have you know huge trade surpluses, which they don't? So they just default. You know, Argentina is a serial defaulter, and everyone expects that. If you um, borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does. They're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Uh, well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. Uh, what about uh, inflation or hyperinflation? Um, what about uh, the foreign exchange rate? Uh, you know, the exchange rate can collapse. And the, these modern monetary theorists. Um, show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the US like a closed economy, which it's not. I mean, if it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning $1 trillion of US Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case, but you do. Um, and they they don't they're just not very knowledgeable about any of those things. But you can think of exchange rates as a conveyor belt. Exchange rates are one way the problems go from one country to another, or good things can go from one country to another, uh, depending on whether your exchange rate is going up or down, the impact on terms of trade, et cetera. But they they completely ignore all that. They also ignore the role of commercial banks. They they just look at the Treasury and the Fed and look at money supply, but like kind of M zero but don't understand how commercial banks create M1 and they do their own thing. They're not, uh, they're not on as short a leash as, as they seem to think. But, but it, you know, if you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she says, well, we don't really need a bond market, US bond market. Uh, we only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. Uh, but why, you know, why have, um, you know, he said, you have government spending, so the treasury borrows money by issuing bonds and then the fed monetizes the bonds by buying the bonds and that gives the treasury the money to pay the bills etc she says do away with all that just give the fed you know wire instructions for lockheed and if you need five f-35 fighter jets order them and just send the money right to lockheed why do you need a bond market i mean she actually says that so okay kind of I mean, legally, that might be possible, but to suggest that you can do that without consequences is nonsense. And they say, what about inflation? Uh, well, she, their view is as long as there's excess capacity and unmet needs, et cetera, you know, you're not going to have inflation because there's a lot of slack in the economy. Well, that's a legitimate debate. But they say when inflation happens, raise taxes. Um, and the, by the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes? And their answer is, we collect taxes to redistribute income. Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. Uh, but, but it's important to bear in mind that Stephanie was the principal economic advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. 
And Bernie Sanders today is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, controls the purse strings. So um, coming out of Congress and Biden's kind of a cipher, he's, you know, he's barely aware of his own existence. So uh, Sanders is in a powerful position and she's she's the, the Bernie whisperer, so to speak, who's behind all this. So uh, if he asked the typical member of Congress, can you define modern monetary theory? They'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means. MMT, you know. But they're acting as they're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior of the Congress, and again, just go back to COVID 2020, because we talked about the debt to GDP ratio. So in um, around May or June um, 2020, Trump put through a um, a one, sorry, a two trillion dollar COVID relief package. And that was when, you know, the, the, pay, the paycheck protection plan, that was 800 billion and everyone got the, the $1,200 check, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end of December, at the very end of the Trump administration, they did another trillion dollars uh, almost. Uh, and that's when everyone got the $600 checks. And now you're up, up to $1,800. Uh, by the way, those checks, that is helicopter money. Um, that's, you know, what the Fed does is, is kind of nonsense, but when it's fiscal policy, not monetary policy, and you're handing out checks, that is helicopter money. And credit to Larry Summers for saying you're going to get inflation out of this. Well, Biden comes into office in January 2021, and he's like not to be outdone. He did his own COVID relief package. That was another two trillion dollars, and that's when we all got the fourteen hundred dollar checks. They just handed them out, and then later that year, uh, or they did the um, trillion dollar infrastructure package. And then just to top it off, we what did we get recently was the, um, the uh, just under a trillion dollar Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Well, and the baseline budget deficit before everything I just described, the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year. So take a trillion dollars for 2020, 2021, and, and 2022, add on you know two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for a second one, uh, two trillion for Biden's first package, one trillion for the Green New Scam, and I think a trillion for infrastructure. That's seven trillion dollars on top of the two trillion dollar baseline budget deficit. So that's nine trillion dollars piled on top of what was at the time um, about a, a twenty-one trillion dollar national debt. So that's how we got to thirty trillion. That's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. These numbers are mind-boggling, and MMT says doesn't matter, but it does matter, and it, it shows up the way I described earlier, which is it it slows growth. You don't get growth. So best case for the U.S. is very slow, weak growth, which we saw from 2009 to 2019. Worst case is you throw a recession on top of that, which we're heading for. Uh, and the U.S. will be in fiscal distress. So the question is, will the Fed go down that path, do what they have to do, do the only thing they can do to subdue inflation at the cost of a very severe recession and something like a stock market crash? Or uh, a couple of things. Number one, I would I would increase my allocation to cash. Um, I'll stick with cash, but let me kind of put that in a context. The most powerful investment tool we have is diversification. Problem is people don't understand what diversification means. So I run into people all the time. They say, well, I'm completely diversified. I own 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors, you know, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, minerals, you know, et cetera. And I say, you're not diversified. You may own 50 stocks in 10 sectors, but you have one asset class, stocks which are subject to conditional correlation. They, in calm markets, yeah, they, they're idiosyncratic, but in panics, they all go down together or in bubbles, they all go up together. So they're, so you're not diversified. So what is diversification? Diversification is having slices of asset classes that are minimally correlated. It's not, probably not zero, but as close to zero as you can get. So what would that be? You'd have a slice of gold, but I recommend 10%. And people, I have some strong views on gold and I've written a lot about it, but people are surprised to hear me say 10%. Like, oh, Jim, why isn't it 50% or 100% if you believe all this? Well, I do believe it. I wouldn't say it if I didn't, but you don't want to be 100% in anything. You don't want to be 50% in anything. 10% is fine. If I'm wrong, you won't get hurt. And if I'm right, you're going to make so much money that it'll actually kind of be the insurance on the rest of your portfolio. But that leaves 90%. So I would have a large slug in cash, maybe 
30%. And people say, well, wait a second, banks pay me 25 basis points, you know, stock market's going up. Why would I want to be in cash? It's horrible. A couple of things. Number one, the stock market might not always go up. Cash is the opposite of leverage. So leverage increases the volatility of the rest of the portfolio. You'll get much bigger returns, but mm-hmm. you'll have much bigger losses. If you have a slice of cash and you say you've got uh, a volatile asset over here, which are stocks, another volatile asset over here, gold's fairly volatile. If you got that volatility and you have cash, it will reduce the overall volatility so you can sleep better at night. Cash is a great asset in deflation. And if you're talking about inflation, which is here, then you got you got to deal with that. But uh, don't rule out deflation. If we go into a recession because the Fed over tightens or, you know, the thing about the, the inflation, just a quick side, there, it comes in two flavors. There's cost push and demand pull. Demand pull is when individuals are, are worried about inflation and they start accelerating purchases like, hey, I better go buy that washing machine right now because the price is going up or better go buy that house right now because the price is going up. That's demand pull. Cost push, uh, uh, cost push. Uh, push comes from the supply side, not the demand side. And that's what we're seeing uh, Mm -hmm. because of what we talked about, supply chain, energy cost. The Fed can't drill for oil. You know, raising interest rates doesn't get you more oil or natural gas. So the Fed can't do anything about it except kill the economy. Yeah, and that'll cool it off. But when you pay, uh, you know, I I put gas in my car. I don't just read about this stuff. You know, it used to be $45. Now it's about $75. Multiply that by 200 million cars uh, across America. What happens is it reduces your discretionary income. If you're paying another 30 bucks at the pump twice a week, then you're not going to go out to dinner Friday night. You're not going to, you know, take a, a vacation, whatever it may be. So that depresses all those other areas. So there is this recursive function. So don't rule out deflation down the road. Not right away, but, you know, maybe next year. So cash, but here's the, here's the biggest value of cash. It gives you optionality, and people don't understand this. Yeah. Uh, what if I said to you, "Hey, I'll sell you, I'll sell you a call option, and at the mar- at the market call option on every asset class in the world?" He goes, "Yeah, that sounds kind of valuable." You know, well, that's what cash is. You, you know, when things are crashing, you're the one who can go shopping, and nobody's better at this than Warren Buffett. He's got his cash level at Berkshire Hathaway is at an all time high. So there's a place for that. You can have some stocks, but I would look at the energy sector. I mean, this. Um, I actually built and I own the largest non-commercial solar module field in New England. And I run my house off it. It produces about 7.5 kilowatt hours. Uh, So I know a little bit about it. And uh, what I know is it doesn't work at night. It doesn't work in snow. It doesn't work in rain. It doesn't work in really cloudy days. By the way, you don't run your house off of solar modules. You run your house off of batteries. Yeah, and the mm-hmm. modules charge the battery, so you watch the battery level. That's how you manage it. So it works fine, but if you think you can run cities with that, forget it. So it's just not practical uh, at that scale, even if you thought it was, and it isn't. That's that's very clear. But here comes, uh, you know, wind turbines and uh, solar. And I'm not against it. Like you say, I own one, but uh, but they're not scalable. They're intermittent, you can, and they don't give you the base power, uh, the baseline power you need to run a modern power grid. Meanwhile, here's global demand, okay? So the gap, the gap's getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. Renewables, whatever the pros and cons, are not closing the gap. The gap's getting bigger. There is no substitute for oil and natural gas and uranium. You got you to gotta put uranium in the mix. And you know, hydro, if you live in Quebec, that's great. A lot of hydro, but it, not so much in the desert. And I've spoken to, you know, without mentioning names, I would say you can go no higher in terms of who knows, you know, let's just say board members of the, five biggest oil companies in the world who, who said, yeah, <laughs> as he said, we talk about that, but we, we can't say it publicly because we'll be, you know, uh, dragged, you know, chained and dragged to the, to, through the streets. But that's just, those are just the facts. So therefore, if you have an oil sector that's been bashed by the climate alarmists and, but you can't do without it, which is true, buy some oil companies, you know, when, when they're, you know, so there's your stock portfolio, private equity, venture, real estate, uh, not commercial, but residential. Yes. And, you know, farmland, that's one of the hottest asset categories, and uh, and gold. So that's diversification, and that's the kind of portfolio you want, the kind of season to taste. So the question is, will the Fed go down that path, do what they have to do, do the only thing they can do uh, to subdue inflation at the cost of a very severe recession and something like a stock market crash, or 
Will they see that coming? They'll be the last to know. We'll, we'll all see it <laughs> before they do, but uh, they'll, they'll be the last to know. It's because they rely on flood, flood models and they're kind of in their own economic forecasting bubble and they're very defective ways of thinking about the economy and they're very much a creature of inertia. There are a whole lot of reasons why the Fed is not nimble. It's kind of quite the opposite, but they'll see it eventually, probably when it's too late. And will they balk at that point and stop rate hikes and maybe even reduce rates? That could save us from the recession, but that will just amplify the inflation. So mm-hmm. rather than say which one's going to happen, I, I prefer to lay out those two paths and then just watch it very carefully. But more to the point, we've seen this movie before. This is a replay, and I, I think it's on, um, you, know, d- you know, like you hit the remote control for double or triple speed. It's going to happen faster. But this is a replay of everything that happened from 2013 to 2019 and, and into 2020, which was, so I'll just go through it quickly. So 2013, May, Bernanke says we're going to taper asset purchases. That's that's money printing, quantitative easing, whatever you want to call it. The market, you know, tanks, bonds go down. Everyone's like, oh, it's over. Bernanke blocked. But finally, in November 2013, they said, okay, the taper begins. They were still printing money, but at a slower rate, and that matters. That went on until late 2014. The taper was over. They stopped buying new assets. They said, okay, here come the interest rate hikes, except that they didn't come for another year. It wasn't until December 2015 that then Janet Yellen finally raised rates. And then another year for the second rate increase, so it was December 2016. So it was really, really slow. It took two and a half years, but they got to two rate hikes. But then here comes Jay Powell, and then like Cloudward, boom, 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 25 basis point hikes every meeting. And all the Fed was trying to do was was to get back to normal. They were trying to get interest rates to maybe two and a quarter, two and a half, get the balance sheet down to, you know, something like 2.5 trillion. They never specified it, but that would have been a reasonable level. So, okay, now interest rates are kind of normal, two and a half, balance sheets down around two and a half trillion. We're back to normal. We finally got through the, the global financial crisis of 2008. We kind of, we undid all that stuff. Well, what happened? Um, from October 1st, 2018 to December 24th, 2018, the stock market dropped 20%. That was the, the, the December 24th, 2018, we call it the, the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock market went down 3% in one day. But the Fed uh, was tightening into the weakness, as they always do. And the last interest rate hike, it was uh, December 16th or 17th, they, within a day or two, but mid-December 2018, they were still hiking and raising rates. And that was the last straw. And then the market just tanked. And then finally, Jay Powell got that message uh, first week of January, 2019. He says, okay, we're, that's it. We're going to be patient. Use the word patient. It's one of these code words. You have to get the code book out and see what it means. But patient means we won't raise rates again without giving you advanced warning so you can get out of your carry trades or whatever. Uh, and then he went further and said, huh, looks like we got to cut rates. And they did. And then by early 2020, here comes the pandemic. And then they took rates all the way back to zero. And then they started QE, I don't know, six, seven, call what you want. They took the balance sheet to seven and a half trillion dollars after getting it down to three and a half trillion. So look at that whole sequence from 2013 to early 2020, including the pandemic. What happened? They tapered the asset purchases. They raised rates. They sank the stock market. Then they said, okay, no more rate hikes. Then they cut rates. And then they started QE. And by by April 2020, where were we? Zero rates, back down to zero, and the balance sheet was a seven and a half trillion after getting down to about uh, three three and a half trillion. So that was a big um, a circle. It ended up back where they started from. But the point being, they failed to normalize. They failed to get rates where they wanted. They failed to get the balance sheet where they wanted. They did sink the stock market. Okay, now two years forward, here we are again. What are we doing? They just raised rates at the at the March meeting. They're going to raise them again in May. I mean, that's the easiest forecast I've ever made. Fifty basis points, May four. Boom. You can you know you can count on it. And they're going to announce. Uh, by the way, I don't have a crystal ball. The Fed told us this. I mean, that's the thing about the Fed. They may be wrong, but they're transparently wrong. So they tell you what mistakes they're going to make in advance. So that's the Fed forecasting is actually fairly straightforward because you just have to believe them. Uh, so uh, so they're going to raise rates again in May, probably fifty basis points. They're going to announce a reduction in the balance sheet, whether they actually start it in May, they probably will, $100 billion a month reduction in asset purchases. So that's QT, quantitative tightening. In other words, they're running the same playbook they tried to run or they started to run in 2013, 2014. 
they failed the last time. Why do they think they're going to be any more successful this time? Why do they think they can get out of this? And the answer is, <coughs> pardon me, the answer is they cannot without a recession. They can normalize rates in the balance sheet and they can stop inflation, but not without causing recession and not without causing a stock market crash. So the big question for the next year is, will the Fed do that? And they may. Or will they balk again, at which point you might rescue the market, but the inflation is just going to go wild? That's that's the debate. But 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 the thing is about framing it that way, you've got two paths, and we'll, we'll get signals along the way. We won't, we won't be the last to know. The Fed will, but we won't. You'll be able to see this coming. I can tell you exactly what the Fed's going to do, and you can do this at home. So if listeners want to take notes, it's, it's really easy. First of all, what is the problem the Fed's trying to solve? What is their solution? And then... What are the exceptions to that so that we can have a complete predictive analytic model? The problem they're trying to solve is the following. We know from a long series of experiences, you know, 30 or more business cycles since the end of World War II, that when the U.S. is in a recession, you have to cut interest rates 3 to 4% to get the U.S. out of a recession. You need 3 to 400 basis points of cuts to get the U.S. It's like a plane heading for the ground. How do you pull it out of a nosedive and get it back up in the sky? The answer is 300 basis points of cuts. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're only at 75 basis points? The answer is you can't. And forget about negative rates. The evidence is now pretty good that negative rates do not work. In other words, negative rates are not more of the same. When you go from, let's say, a half of 1%, then you go to a quarter, and then you go to zero, and then you keep going to negative 25, you didn't just ease by another 25 basis points. The evidence from Japan and Europe is that you're through the looking glass and you have very strange effects, really unintended consequences. I'll give you a couple examples. So the conventional theory is, well, the more I cut interest rates, the more stimulus I get. That's a joke, but that's what they think. But if I go negative, you're absolutely going to go out and spend the money. Because if you don't spend the money, I'm going to take it away. You sit there long enough, you'll have nothing left in your bank account because I'm going to take, with these negative interest rates, I'm going to take it away. So people will run out and spend and the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, from the lending point of view, they'll borrow money, you know, because the bank pays you to be a borrower. But here's what happens in the real world. And this is the difference between academics and human beings. When people see negative interest rates, people have goals in mind. They have lifetime goals, right? They want a kid's education, parents' health care, their own health care, retirement. If you start taking their money away with negative rates, guess what they do? They save more. They're like, hey, I got to put my kids through college. You're taking my money away. I better save more. And then what kind of signal is the central bank sending with negative interest rates? They're sending a deflationary signal. So people go, well, if, you're, if you think it's going to be deflation, I'm not going to spend money. I'll wait till the price comes down. So you're trying to encourage lending and spending. And what you get is more savings and no spending, deferred spending. You if they fail to have at least 2% inflation per year, then it means the economy is going into deflation. Or to put it simply, the economy is slowing down and therefore unemployment is going to go up and the economy will go into recession. In order to prevent that from happening, the Federal Reserve have to target the inflation to at least 2% per year in order to bring price stability to the market and to keep the economic wheel running smooth. At least that's the theory, but to Jim Rickards it doesn't make any sense. The Fed have raised interest rates way too high but the inflation is not going down yet. In fact, inflation goes way up even higher than before. People said between 1913 and 2023, the dollar has lost 95% of its value, but we don't need to wait for another 110 years. Jim Rickards explains that in the 1980s, the dollar loses half of its value in just five years. Will it do that again? Will the economy goes into recession? Let's find out. A lot of people like to bang the table and say, you know, since since the creation of the Fed in 1913, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power. Well, that's a true statement, but you don't need 110 years. We lost 50% in five years between 1977 and 1982. So inflation is insidious. It is a tax. Uh, it is a form of theft. But like the kid with the mother's wallet, if you keep the theft, you know, in small little bites, but do it long enough, you can get the whole thing and no one will notice. So they say we want 2% because uh, we want to be able to cut if we have to. But the real reason is we want to basically erode the value of the debt and erode the purchasing power of the dollar in ways that you don't notice and and they can be very patient and that's how they do it but to your point Addison, well hasn't the fed been raising interest rates yes but real rates are still negative so if inflation is nine and the fed's at two the real rate is negative seven 
that's that's a really really low interest rate and if you say okay inflation's come down to six and the fed's up to you know four uh, about four and a half right now um so the real rate is now negative one and a half in my example um well that's a lot less than than seven but still a negative real rate we are not in the world of positive real rates so then the question is okay how how is the fed doing at getting inflation to the target the the two percent we talked about and explain why that's their number and this says a lot about what's going on in the stock market right now because you go all the way back to august 26 2022 that was jay powell's jackson hole speech and he said inflation's uh, you know not, he didn't use the word out of control but he said inflation is way too high we're going to bring it down to our two percent target um we know unemployment's going to go up we know he will probably have recession he did not use the r word he didn't say recession but he said you know growth will suffer unemployment will go up that's just a fancy way of saying there's going to be a recession and we're not going to stop until we get there uh and so in other words too bad you know unemployment's going to go up to some number i don't know what four or five percent which is pretty high it's, it's right now it's uh 3.4 i believe the lowest since 1969 so unemployment's going to go up the economy's going to go into recession but too bad that's the price we all have to pay to get inflation down under control on the way to two percent in other words in the way jay powell rationalizes this he said yeah that's painful and we're going to pay a high price to get there but we're going to pay a higher price if we don't if we don't get to two percent and we let this thing spiral out of control and we even stay at four or five percent for a prolonged period of time that the economic damage from that in terms of lost investment misallocation of capital basically people losing money on their investments uh is going to be much higher than maybe a short recession here's the interesting part jerome powell scares the market with six speeches he said the same thing again and again we need to get to 2% inflation, which means raising the interest rates even more, and therefore we're going to have a recession and unemployment is going to go up. With the Fed being hawkish, the market should go down, instead, the market got rallied because they believe inflation is going to go down soon. Jim Rickards think the Fed is already reached at something called the terminal rate, a rate which inflation will go down on its own so the Fed won't need to raise the interest rates any further. But the Fed keeps raising it and making the economy crash even further. So how is it going to end? When will the Fed needs to stop raising interest rates? Let's listen to what Jim Rickards have to say. So he said that the market didn't believe him. The market rallied. I went down a little bit right around that time, but then the market rallied in October. And he comes out at the end of September, he gives another speech at an FOMC meeting, comes out November 2nd, gives another speech, comes out November 30th, gives a speech at the Brookings Institution, uh, and then comes out in mid-December, with another speech and then again a couple of weeks ago on uh, February 1st so it's like six speeches in uh about about five months and he said the same thing every time he said we're getting to two percent you know believe believe me when I said we're gonna have a recession unemployment's gonna go up too bad we have a lot of work to do we're not done the market has flipped on and off half the time the market doesn't believe me go yeah you say that but uh, in fact, inflation is coming down faster than you thought. You're probably, uh, I should introduce a concept. Um, I guess a lot of people have heard of it, but there's this new concept called the terminal rate. The Fed's trying to get to the terminal rate. And so what's the terminal rate? Well, no one actually knows what the number is. I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. But it's a theory. And the theory is, okay, the, the, the terminal rate is a rate set by the Fed that's high enough to bring inflation down without further rate hikes. We get to a level and that level is high enough that inflation will come down on its own just by waiting without raising the rate again. And the conundrum, I hate to use that word, but it is a conundrum. The conundrum the Fed faces right now is they have been raising rates and inflation has been coming down. Those two things are true. But is inflation coming down because they're raising rates? in which case maybe you want to keep raising them uh or are you already at the terminal rate it's coming down on its own and now the danger is you're going to go too far and that's the debate with Wall Street and so Wall Street is sort of leaning to the view now you're probably already at the terminal rate inflation is coming down you need to back off you need to stop uh and probably pivot this was the famous word for the last six months 
the pivot means you're, you're actually going to have to cut rates uh, because you have gone too far and you're going to cause a pretty bad recession. And so the expectation as recently as December was that the Fed would pivot around March or April. They would, Yeah, they would raise in February, maybe March, but pretty quickly after that, they would cut rates. And if the Fed's cutting rates, buy stocks. You know, it's typical Wall Street analysis. It always ends with buy stocks, um, particularly tech stocks. So, with the current high interest rates environment and reckless government spending, what should we do to protect our money from inflation? Should we buy stocks? And what stocks should we buy? The Fed said it will raise the interest rates even further but the market thinks the opposite will happen, so who's right and wrong here? Let's hear what Jim Rickards think. Spoiler alert. This is not investment advice. But the Fed has been saying the opposite. So this has been this battle where Powell goes one, two, three, four, five, six speeches, says the same thing. We're not stopping. And Wall Street says, oh, yes, you are. So buy stocks. Well, who's right? Well, there's an old saying on Wall Street, don't fight the Fed. I don't think of it as who's right or wrong. You could have an opinion. The way I think of it is I just want to know what you're going to do. Because if I know what you're going to do, then you can trade accordingly. You can plan for that and you can prepare for it. And what they're going to do is they're going to keep raising rates. Even if they're at the terminal rate already, I think they might be. Uh, even if they are, they don't think so. Their opinion counts for a lot more than mine. And they're going to keep going. But by the time inflation comes down enough to say, yeah, okay, we're at the terminal rate. Nice job. It'll be too late. They will have gone too far because the Fed's always the last to know. So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever, whatever's the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. With some exceptions, but they, they kind of like you know, an inch a year, a couple inches a year, but they, but they move mountains. I mean, they just, they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful, but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of, of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but you apply this to any country, I focus on the, the debt to GDP ratio, because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. And a simple example if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least to fall on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you, know, you just write a check. It's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The US just hit uh, $31 trillion in, uh, in national debt. That is national debt, almost all of it in the form of US Treasury securities. Uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly US Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130%. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30%. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions. No big deal. 30% um, is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. Uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the master's treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do, you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or 
or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. If you, uh, you say, what's the critical threshold where you know, water turns to steam or you know, water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same, it's, it's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The, end, the, best, the, the best research says the answer is 90%. And this comes out of you know, Ken Rogoff at uh, Harvard, also Carmen Reinhardt, who's now the uh, chief economist at the World Bank. But they've looked at uh, hundreds of cases over hundreds of years. And I like that because it's not just you know, kind of cherry picking data. Uh, developed economies, developing economies, uh, economies that issue debt in their own currencies, ones that issue debt in other currencies, principally U.S. dollars, et cetera. So, you know, a wide variety of case studies. And they show that not, when you when your debt to G, GDP ratio goes over 90 percent, your your multiplier of an additional debt uh, of additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context, at 30 percent, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar thirty of growth. You know, assuming you spend it wisely, that's a, that's a big condition. But uh, you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar thirty of growth. Okay, the debt was productive if you if you put it to good use. Uh, but that that dollar thirty gets smaller and smaller. As you get close to ninety percent, it goes to a dollar twenty, a dollar ten, a dollar five. Past ninety percent, you know, roughly. Uh, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar and you only get 95 cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then 90% and 85%, et cetera. So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, you know, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of uh, modern monetary theory. She's a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter that, uh, you know, she, they always point to Japan. Japan is at uh, 280%, um, way past any, any member of the peer group. Um, China's probably higher. China's a little more opaque because, well, because they are, but also they, they don't have as much national debt. If you, if you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of, of provincial debt. And the banks, the banking system is, is owned by the government or controlled by the government. So when you throw in, when you throw in the bank debt, the state-owned enterprises, the provincial debt and the, and the government. So that's the real national debt. Kelton says, Stephanie Kelton says, uh, it doesn't matter because um, you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentina and you borrow in dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have, you know, huge trade surpluses, which they don't. So they just default, you know, Argentina is a serial defaulter and everyone expects that. If you um, borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Uh, well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. Uh, what about uh, inflation or hyperinflation? Um, what about uh, the foreign exchange rate? Uh, you know, the exchange rate can collapse. And the, these modern monetary theorists um, show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. I mean, if it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning $1 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do. Um, and they, they don't, they're just not very knowledgeable about any of those things. But you can think of exchange rates as a conveyor belt. Exchange rates are one way the problems go from one country to another, or good things can go from one country to another. Uh, depending on whether your exchange rate is going up or down, the impact on terms of trade, et cetera. But they, they completely ignore all that. They also ignore the role of commercial banks. They, they just look at the Treasury and the Fed and look at money supply, but like kind of M0, but don't understand how commercial banks create M1 and they do their own thing. They're not, uh, they're not on as short a leash as, as they seem to think. But, but it, you know, if you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she says, well, we don't really need a bond market, a U.S. bond market. Uh, we only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. 
Uh, but why, you know, why have, um, you know, he said, you have government spending. So the treasury borrows money by issuing bonds. And then the Fed monetizes the bonds by buying the bonds. And that gives the treasury the money to pay the bills, et cetera. She says, do away with all that. Just give the Fed, you know, wire instructions for Lockheed. And if you need five F-35 fighter jets, order them, just send the money right to Lockheed. Why do you need a bond market? I mean, she actually says that. So, okay, kind of, I mean, legally, that might be possible, but to suggest that you can do that without consequences is nonsense. And then you say, what about inflation? Uh, well, she, their view is as long as there's excess capacity and unmet needs, et cetera, you know, you're not going to have inflation because there's a lot of slack in the economy. Well, that's a legitimate debate. But what they say when inflation happens, raise taxes. Um, and the, by the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes? And their answer is, we collect taxes to redistribute income. Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. Uh, but, but it's important to bear in mind that Stephanie was the principal economic advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. And Bernie Sanders today is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, controls the purse strings. So um, coming out of Congress and Biden's kind of a cipher, he's, you know, he's barely aware of his own existence. So uh, Sanders is in a powerful position and she's, she's the, the Bernie whisperer, so to speak, who's behind all this. So uh, if you ask the typical member of Congress, can you define modern monetary theory? They'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means, MMT, you know. But they're acting as they're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior of the Congress, and again, just go back to COVID 2020, because we talked about the debt to GDP ratio. So in um, around May or June um, 2020, Trump put through a, um, a one, sorry, a two trillion dollar covid relief package and that was when you know the the, pay, the paycheck protection plan that was 800 billion and everyone got the the 1200 check you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then at the end of december at the very end of the trump administration they did another trillion dollars uh, almost uh and that's when everyone got the 600 dollars checks and now you're up, up to 1800 dollars uh, by the way those checks that is helicopter money um that's you know what the fed does is is kind of nonsense, but when it's fiscal policy, not monetary policy, and you're handing out checks, that is helicopter money and credit to Larry Summers for saying, you're gonna get inflation out of this. Well, Biden comes into office in January, 2021, and he's like not to be outdone. He did his own COVID relief package. That was another $2 trillion. And that's when we all got the $1,400 checks. They just handed them out. And then later that year, uh, or they did the, um, trillion dollar infrastructure package. And then just to top it off, we what we get recently was the, uh, the uh, just under a trillion dollar Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Well, and the baseline budget deficit before everything I just described, the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year. So take a trillion dollars for 2020, 2021, and, and 2022, add on you know two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for a second one, uh, two trillion for Biden's first package, one trillion for the Green New Scam, and I think a trillion for infrastructure. That's seven trillion dollars on top of the two trillion dollar baseline budget deficit. So that's nine trillion dollars piled on top of what was at the time um, about a, a twenty one trillion dollar national debt. So that's how we got to thirty trillion. That's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. These numbers are mind boggling and MMT says doesn't matter, but it does matter. And it, it shows up the way I described earlier, which is it, it slows growth. You don't get growth. So best case for the US is very slow, weak growth, which we saw from 2009 to 2019. Worst case is you throw a recession on top of that, which we're heading for, uh, and the US will be in fiscal distress. The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8, 9, 10% or, or more. The US had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a trillion dollars per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre pandemic. The Congress threw $3 trillion of emergency aid on top of that. 
I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled $3 trillion on top. Now, this is going to take the U.S. debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de- debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator yeah. and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. If you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get if you get them right, um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy, starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, et cetera. So um, human nature doesn't change, or at least it hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one and an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, so what? So the G- debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. Who cares? Well, what's wrong with it? 180%. We got issues. We got problems. Print up the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What What is the problem? Uh, this This comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed, it's wrong, but it's it's got its followers and those followers are now in the White House because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. They take the view that if the Treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? That's ridiculous, but that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they, they um, build aircraft, they have benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be. That That's the, the real source of money. They also take the treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now, that's not legally the case. The treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. Oh. The treasury is just part of the executive branch. Uh, and the Fed is an independent agency, uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. Uh, that a lot of people know. Some people know that. Some people don't. But the the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so of Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate. But but the theorists ignore that and say no. Uh, the Treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have you borrow to cover it, you issue bonds to cover the borrowing. And if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free healthcare, free childcare, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2 Oh, sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And like, look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it, but, uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain, my, explain that. Uh, up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay down debt, when you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You, you hoard cash or people were buying gold, they were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So, um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must, the government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar 50 of GDP. Uh, 
Now, there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward. But so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think he had a little Einstein on I me mean, because of the general theory of relativity, but um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra, GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, et cetera. So now... Not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff, more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll, give it, I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point. Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what, but what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right, the more you borrow, it's actually a headwind to growth. Now you get le just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more. Oh, sorry, it, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. So it's one way to pay, people say America has never defaulted on a step. Well, first of all, that's not true. It's not a true statement. But the, the easiest, quietest, stealthiest way to default is inflation. It's like, hey, here's your billion dollars back. You know, good luck buying a loaf of bread because I've destroyed the value of the dollar. And so now 3%, um, We'll do it in, um, do the math, we'll do that in uh, about 22 years. At 10%, you, you cut the value of the dollar in half in seven years. Uh, by the way, that is what happened between 1977 and 1981. In that five-year period, uh, the dollar lost over 50% of its purchasing power. According to Jim Rickards, hyperinflation is coming to America, and the raising of interest rates won't be able to help fight inflation. In fact, it will make inflation even worse. Inflation will impact stock market as Jim Rickards think it will brings the economy into recession, and unemployment will go up to 4 or maybe even 5%. But all Jerome Powell can say is, too bad, that's painful and we have to get there, but we're gonna pay higher prices if we don't. And then there's the myth of 2% inflation. The Federal Reserve have something called inflation targeting, where if they fail to have at least 2% inflation per year then it means the economy is going into deflation, or to put it simply, the economy is slowing down and therefore unemployment is going to go up and the economy will go into recession. In order to prevent that from happening, the Federal Reserve have to target the inflation to at least 2% per year in order to bring price stability to the market and to keep the economic wheel running smooth. At least that's the theory, but to Jim Rickards it doesn't make any sense. The Fed have raised interest rates way too high but the inflation is not going down yet. In fact, inflation goes way up even higher than before. 
people said between 1913 and 2023, the dollar has lost 95% of its value, but we don't need to wait for another 110 years. Jim Rickards explains that in the 1980s, the dollar loses half of its value in just five years. Will it do that again? Will the economy goes into recession? Let's find out. A lot of people like to bang the table and say, you know, since since the creation of the Fed in 1913, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power. Well, that's a true statement, but you don't need 110 years. We lost 50% in five years between 1977 and 1982. So inflation is insidious. It is a tax. Uh, it is a form of theft. But like the kid with the mother's wallet, if you keep the theft you know, in small little bites, but do it long enough, you can get the whole thing and no one will notice. So they say we want 2% because uh, we want to be able to cut if we have to. But the real reason is we want to basically erode the value of the debt and erode the purchasing power of the dollar in ways that you don't notice. And and they can be very patient. That's how they do it. But to your point, Addison, well, hasn't the Fed been raising interest rates? Yes. But real rates are still negative. So if inflation is nine and the Fed's at two, the real rate is negative seven. That's, that's a really, really low interest rate. And if you say, okay, inflation has come down to six and the Fed's up to you know, four, uh, about four and a half right now. Um, so the real rate is now negative one and a half in my example. Um, well, that's a lot less than, than seven, but still a negative real rate. We are not in the world of positive real rates. So then the question is, okay, how how is the Fed doing at getting inflation to the target? The, the 2% we talked about, and we explained why that's their number. And this says a lot about what's going on in the stock market right now, because you go all the way back to August 26, 2022. That was Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. And he said, inflation's, at, you know, not, he didn't use the word out of control, but he said inflation is way too high. We're going to bring it down to our 2% target. Um, we know unemployment's going to go up. We know he will probably have recession. He did not use the R word. He didn't say recession, but he said, you know, growth will suffer. Unemployment will go up. That's just a fancy way of saying there's going to be a recession. And we're not going to stop until we get there. Uh, and so in other words, too bad, you know, unemployment's going to go up to some number. I don't know what, four or five percent, which is pretty high. It's, it's right now it's uh, three point four, I believe the lowest since 1969. So unemployment is going to go up, the economy is going to go into recession, but too bad. That's the price we all have to pay to get inflation down under control on the way to 2%. In other words, in the way Jay Powell rationalizes this, he said, yeah, that's painful and we're going to pay a high price to get there, but we're going to pay a higher price if we don't. If we don't get to 2% and we let this thing spiral out of control and we even stay at 4 or 5% for a prolonged period of time, that the economic damage from that in terms of lost investment, misallocation of capital, basically people losing money on their investments, uh, is going to be much higher than maybe a short recession. Here's the interesting part. Jerome Powell scares the market with six speeches. He said the same thing again and again. We need to get to 2% inflation, which means raising the interest rates even more, and therefore we're going to have a recession and unemployment is going to go up. With the Fed being hawkish, the market should go down, instead, the market got rallied because they believe inflation is going to go down soon. Jim Rickards think the Fed is already reached at something called the terminal rate, a rate which inflation will go down on its own so the Fed won't need to raise the interest rates any further. But the Fed keeps raising it and making the economy crash even further. So how is it going to end? When will the Fed needs to stop raising interest rates? Let's listen to what Jim Rickards have to say. So he said that the market didn't believe him. The market rallied. I uh, went down a little bit right around that time, but then the market rallied in October. And he comes out at the end of September, he gives another speech at an FOMC meeting, comes out November 2nd, gives another speech, comes out November 30th, gives a speech at the Brookings Institution, uh, and then comes out in mid-December with another speech. And then again, a couple of weeks ago on uh, February 1st. So it's like six speeches in uh, about about five months. And he said the same thing every time. He said, we're getting to 2%. You know, believe believe me when I said, we're going to have a recession. Unemployment's going to go up. Too bad. We have a lot of work to do. We're not done. The market has flipped on and off. Half the time, the market doesn't believe me. They go, yeah, you say that. 
but uh, in fact, inflation is coming down faster than you thought. You're probably, uh, I should introduce a concept. Uh, I guess a lot of people have heard of it, but there's this new concept called the terminal rate. The Fed's trying to get to the terminal rate. And so what's the terminal rate? Well, no one actually knows what the number is. I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. But it's a theory. And the theory is, okay, the, the, the terminal rate is a rate set by the Fed that's high enough to bring inflation down without further rate hikes. We get to a level and that level is high enough that inflation will come down on its own just by waiting without raising the rate again. And the conundrum, I hate to use that word, but it is a conundrum. The conundrum the Fed faces right now is they have been raising rates and inflation has been coming down. Those two things are true. But is inflation coming down because they're raising rates? in which case maybe you want to keep raising them, uh, or are you already at the terminal rate? It's coming down on its own, and now the danger is you're going to go too far. And that's the debate with Wall Street. And so Wall Street is sort of leaning to the view, now you're probably already at the terminal rate. Inflation is coming down. You need to back off. You need to stop uh, and probably pivot. This was the famous word for the last six months. The pivot means you're, you're actually going to have to cut rates. Uh, because you have gone too far and you're going to cause a pretty bad recession. And so the expectation as recently as December was that the Fed would pivot around March or April. They would, yeah, they would raise in February, maybe March, but pretty quickly after that, they would cut rates. And if the Fed's cutting rates, buy stocks. You know, it's typical Wall Street analysis. It always ends with buy stocks, um, particularly tech stocks. So, with the current high interest rates environment and reckless government spending, what should we do to protect our money from inflation? Should we buy stocks? And what stocks should we buy? The Fed said it will raise the interest rates even further but the market thinks the opposite will happen, so who's right and wrong here? Let's hear what Jim Rickards think. Spoiler alert. This is not investment advice. But the Fed has been saying the opposite, so there's been this battle where Powell goes one, two, three, four, five, six speeches, says the same thing. We're not stopping. And Wall Street says, oh yes you are, so buy stocks. Well, who's right? Well, there's no saying on Wall Street, don't fight the Fed. I don't think of it as who's right or wrong. You could have an opinion. The way I think of it is, I just want to know what you're going to do. Because if I know what you're going to do, then you can trade accordingly, you can plan for that, and you can prepare for it. And what they're going to do is they're going to keep raising rates. Even if they're at the terminal rate already, I think they might be. Uh, even if they are, they don't think so. Their opinion counts for a lot more than mine. And they're going to keep going. But by the time inflation comes down enough to say, yeah, okay, we're at the terminal rate, nice job, it'll be too late. They will have gone too far because the Fed's always the last to know.